you are too. Speaking of God's side, let's talk about Genesis, his word, as our faith grows. So Genesis chapter 12, uh, is we're going to start at verse 9 and go all the way to the end of it. As we look at Genesis, this is the God's call to Abram. Last week I shared what Abram and his, about Abraham and his path of faith and the three steps for all of us to follow in our own paths of faith. And thank you, all of you that have called and texted me and told me about that message really ministering to you. It really ministered to me. And uh, when, a when a message ministers to the person who's giving it, that's when, you know, when you, that's when you know you've hit a home run. And they all do. All right, I told you about three steps of faith. To save your faith, faith become sight. Walking in faith, waiting in faith, and worshiping in faith. We'll continue on that path tonight. Tonight we pick up Abram's story at verse 9 of Genesis chapter 12. This time, instead of walking the path of faith, which we did last week, believe it or not, Abram will actually forsake the path of faith. We ended the last week with a high note in Abram's life. This week we begin one of his low spots, one of his low notes. Abraham forsaking the path of faith. And he moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel, and he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. Now look at the chart here and follow where I'm telling you. To the extreme right, you'll see that that's Shechem. He's going to Shechem, to Bethel, and watch what happens now. There he built an altar to the Lord and called the name of the, on the Lord. So Abraham journeyed, going on still towards the south. So he doesn't stay in Bethel. This dotted line with the arrow shows where he's going to travel to. Now listen, no one backslides overnight, but one bad step away from God leads to another, and another, and another. And before you know it, you're in Satan's arms. And remember, he had been camped between Bethel, the house of God, and Ai, the place of Rune. There's that chart I showed you before. As you look at this chart, you'll see Bethel, a high spot, and you'll see Ai, and Shechem. Ai is over here, right by Bethel, and Shechem. But he's gonna start traveling south. He's gonna go past these mountains down to the right, and down to that corner in that chart. I told you that the real path of faith runs parallel to the road of Rune. When you're using your faith, doubt comes all the time. It's, it's, a, it's a double path. It, it runs parallel, so it's like a train track, both rails of a train track. Abraham is near Bethel, and he's camped there, made an altar there, God's house. God always offers his house to those who have lost theirs. With the house of God open to him in the place of Rune there to remind him of the reality of what the world really was and was like, Abram should have settled in Bethel. He should have stayed there. A God would have taken care of him. Remember, he was in the middle of both places, straddling, waiting, walking, worshiping, good things, ready to make a decision, God's house or the world's dwelling. He does what any carnal man would do. He blows it. He chooses neither one. And he drifts away from a point of decision. By not making a decision is a decision. If you're not for God, in itself, you are against God, the Bible says. So Abram makes a bad choice. The tug and lure of Egypt drew him away from his Bethel, the house of God, when famine hit. But how? You see, most of us don't want the fullness of an evil world, hey I. And we also, unfortunately, rarely follow everything and every place God wants us to be. I know it's hard to hear, but so we, like Abram, split the difference. And not forsaking God fully, and not being a part of the sinful choice fully, we compromise. We travel south, so to speak. Most awful thing a Christian can do is compromise. And we, like Abraham, go further south to Egypt. Egypt. It represents the world and its allure. The result, in short, Abraham backslides. He commits to the pressures of what I call the six F's. There they are. Famine pushes them. Foreboding, falsehood, frustration, flattery, and failure. That's all the outline that you'll need for the rest of chapter 12. It's a formula for failure. Abraham backslides. Forsaking the path of faith, the revelation of God, for whatever reason, always, not sometimes, but always brings its own complication. Did God say, I will bring you into, into a land that will be yours, but you know, don't stay there. Go down to Egypt that's not yours. Did he say that? Never. God told him to go to Canaan, and that's where he should have stayed. He would have been in God's wills, but he decides to do something different because of the famine. Just because you have faith doesn't mean something, something hard's not gonna come at you. Just because you're walking in faith doesn't mean that something will come that, that makes you wanna question your faith. It will, and that's what happened. The famine came, and now Abraham's questioning whether he should stay in Cana, which is where God told him he's gonna own, he's gonna have it. 
And, uh, but he's questioning it. Now, listen, it's a whole series of events. It's like a domino theory. I was going to take a bunch of dominoes out when we were kids. We'd line up those dominoes. We'd put the first uh, on end on end, and we'd put the first one down. And, they, and you've seen it. It'd all go, go down. That's exactly how you get away from God. One bad choice almost always spiritually leads to another. So the first bridge, Genesis 12.10. Now there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to well, dwell there, for the famine was severe in the land. But pastor, you don't know how hard I had it. I had to go over here. I had to do this. He's, he's justifying. It's a test. Lack of anything always is. Lack of money is a test. Lack of health is a test. Lack of happiness is a test. Lack of work is a test. I said something the other day to someone, and I don't know if I said it last week or not, but it bears repeating. Having cancer that threatens my life and somebody giving a whole lot of money to someone is the exact same thing. Both of them are a test. I've seen Christians get a whole lot of money and move away from God, blow it. I've seen Christians get a whole lot of money and use it for God. I've seen people get cancer that's life-threatening and blame God and move away from Him. And of course, I know someone, myself, who has cancer and I'm closer to God than I ever have been. So it's a test. Life has tests. All over the place it has tests. None of us are exempt from it. This famine is a test. There were two things in Canaan, the promised land that Abraham didn't expect to find there. The Canaanites and famine. Now listen, famine means lack of something. This is good. If anything will get you to move away from God or God's house, it's lack of something. Christians have no fun. Churches just want your time and money. I don't have enough money. Listen, or lack of answers. My prayers aren't being answered. You pray and you pray. But lack of an answer is all you come up with. You need help. And your Christian brothers and sisters in the church aren't meeting your needs. Lack of support, lack of help, lack of concern. Be careful. If you don't write it out, your next step is over a bridge that starts a domino effect. The famine took over the land and it hit Abraham also, right after he abandons Bethel. You see, the truth is, moving away from God's dwelling place, his house, Bethel, will increase not decrease the famine in the soul of man. It was inevitable for Abram to reach the next downward bridge. And here it is, foreboding. Famine was his first downfall, the first domino, and now foreboding. And it came to pass when he was close to entering Egypt that he said to Sarai, his wife, indeed, I know that you are a woman of beautiful countenance. By the way, she is believed to be the most beautiful woman in in. Uh, in actually the world, believe it or not. Uh, there's writings of, of her over and over again, writings about her from rabbis over and over again, talking about her exceptional beauty. And she's not young, she's old at this time. Therefore, it will happen when the Egyptians see you, because she's beautiful, they will say, this is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will let you live. So tell them, you're my sister. Foreboding, he's worried. This is the first mention of Egypt in the Bible. It will be referred to 600 more times throughout Scripture. Egypt is not only a physical place, it's a typology. It always refers to the world. It refers to the world's wealth, its wisdom, its wickedness, and yes, even the world's worship. And it's always alluring. It always pulls people in. What Egypt was to Abraham, the world is to us. That's our Egypt. That sinful world I've been telling you about in the news. That's our Egypt. Let me ask you, where was Jesus crucified? You can answer it at home. Maybe you're with someone else. What mountain, Golgotha? Near what city, Jerusalem? In what country, Israel? Well, nope. I mean, yes, but no. Look at Revelation. Revelation 11. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them, the saints, and conquer them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the streets of the great city that symbolically is called Sodom and Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. So why would the Bible tell us that Jesus was crucified. We all know he's crucified in Israel and Jerusalem on Golgotha's Hill because it's the world that's crucifying him. Egypt is symbolic with the world, just like Sodom is. So, and it will crucify you one way or the other. Give it a chance and the world will crucify you. Go down to it and it'll crucify you. We see something happening here, this foreboding. The world, it's the devil's liar for sinners and it's the lure for saints. And no one's, no one's exempt. All of us fall prey to it one way or another. It's here where Abraham forebodes. To forebode means to have a, a premonition of future misfortune. He feels that when he goes into Egypt, 
he's going to be killed because his wife's so beautiful, so he asks her to lie. He's fearing. He's wearing his fear. We all do it. Only it increases when we face famine, when we face lack. I know I'm talking to a whole bunch of people tonight. Something hasn't happened for you. You've prayed and prayed and it hasn't happened. And what happens is you start to forebode. After your famine or whatever you're not getting, you start to forebode. It's because of you feel your prayers are not being answered. Now listen, for a Christian that's supposed to be walking with God, when we face worldly peril, foreboding is always evil. Why? Because of these verses and more. If the Lord delights in a man's way, he makes his steps firm. Though he stumble, he will not fall, for the Lord upholds him with, with his hand. That doesn't say you'll never stumble. It says when you stumble. If you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Now, by the way, heals you means that he's, he's healing you from diseases. Therefore, maybe you didn't even get them because he healed it. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat, drink, or your body, what you'll wear. Don't worry about famine. <laughs> Is not life more than food and body more than clothes? Matthew 6, 25. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but ask whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. God's over and over again telling us about, about He'll supply our needs. This, by the way, is the Jehovah Jireh verse. And notice that, that He says here, don't premeditate what you're going to say. Don't premeditate. Go through whatever you have to go through. I'll take care of you. I'll, I'll send the Spirit to, in your mouth to speak. Don't premeditate. Abraham's premeditating. It's making him forebode. He's thinking the only the evil that's going to happen. Whoa. Abraham was foreboding when he saw Egypt. Looking at the world, worldly futures always get us to forebode. I mean, come on. Liberal administrations, pol politics of lies, the new age, universalism, complacency, the family in America, school system, crime, taxes, social security, inflation, retirement, pastor marks in the news. <laughs> A lot of it can get us to forebode. Say, man, I want to hear something good. Well, we're all that way. But that doesn't make it go away. And remember, this time, Abram is 76 years old. By the way, Sarai is 66, and she's still considered the most beautiful woman ever. Um, Abram looked at Egypt. Then Abraham looked at Sarai, considered one of the most beautiful women in the world. And by the way, uh, the word Sarai is actually has one definition of yafer, has a, a root that means beautiful. Abraham looked at himself. What do I do? Did you ever say that? What do I do? I don't have enough money. I had somebody call me the other day, told me about some scam that happened to them. They lost hundreds of thousands of dollars. And they said, what do I do? Christian, great Christian guy. What do you do? Abram looked at himself, which is when you look at yourself, you have to look away from God. He's more insecure and possessive than ever. And Abram said, uh-oh, I better control this bad situation that's about to happen. They're going to kill me. They're going to take her and they're going to kill me. Listen, insecure people love to control others. Don't let them. Let me repeat it. Insecure people love to control others. Don't let them. So he says to Sarah, his wife, when they see me and see you and put two and two together, knowing you're my wife, they're going to kill me so that they can have you. You can almost see the next step before it comes. A dark shadow had enveloped Abram's soul. And from their shadow, more darkness would come out. Remember, this is the father of faith but not yet. During the dark ages, and excuse me, during the dark days of World War II, King George VI would speak to the British people over the BBC. Hitler was blitzkrieging London with the V2 rocket, unmanned and launched from Germany 350 miles away. It rained terror on England, day after day, night after night. The Luftwaffe, a German Air Force, went on daily sorties and blanketed the, and, and blitzed the life out of London. When Big Bertha, not a golf club, but a mobile 20-inch cannon, one of the largest cannons ever, mounted to a railroad car, could fire up to 50 miles away from its target. They would fire it over the, over the, over the uh, English Channel and hit London. During these days, when Winston Churchill had sought to rally the nation, right after Dunkirk, when Allied forces were in disarray, King George VI of England, a truly saved and godly man, read this poem by Louise Haskins to a blacked out nation over the BBC. 
they say, when I read about it, they say that every single person in London was listening. Here's the poem. And I said to the man who stood by the gate of this year, give me a light that I may tread safely into the unknown. And he replied, go out into the darkness and put your hand into the hand of God. That shall be to you better than light and safer than a known way. So I went forth and finding the hand of God, trod gladly into the night. And he led me toward the hills and the breaking of day in the lone east. What does it say? When dark times come, reach out in those dark times to God. Don't try to get out of it yourself. Reach out to God. That's what, exactly what God wanted Abram to do in this massive famine. What he wants us to do when we face the unknown. But Abram had taken his hand out of the hand of God. He could take matters into his own hands. No wonder foreboding filled his heart. Then he went to step number three. Step number three is falsehood. Please say you are my sister, that it may be well with me for your sake, and that I may live because of you. False. What a selfish, despicable request. Say you're my sister. They're going to have at it with you. They're going to, Pharaoh's going to take you in, and he's going, to, he's going to lie with you. But do it because I don't want to die. What do you think Sarah was thinking? Maybe like all men are stupid. All men are despicable. Some men are stupid. Some men are despicable. Abraham is stupid. Abraham is dis despicable. It's a wonder Sarah even spoke to him again, unless, unless she went along with it. Listen, there's no knowing how low a saint will sink once he gets out of touch with God. I'm hardly ever surprised anymore when a saint gets caught in major sin. One of the things that bugs me to no end is when a pastor falls and he's having, been having sexual affairs for years while he's preaching in his church. It bothers me to no end. Those are my peers and it bothers me. All you have to do is face famine without God. All you have to do is entertain foreboding instead of faith. One pastor that recently fell of a mega church said his wife wasn't meeting his needs, so he abused the 15 year old. If that was a famine, then you should have done something about it and allowed God to do something about it. So all you have to do is face famine without God, entertain foreboding instead of faith, and soon you'll be living in falsehood. Listen, a half-truth is a full lie. When we justify self, we take justification out of the hands of God. If we really want to do something wrong, most of the times we can easily, we can easily justify it. Abram would tell himself, well, God promised me children. I don't have any children yet because I know God doesn't lie. I have lots of life ahead of me, so I better protect my life. So, God will, so, so basically, God will protect me and Sarah no matter what I do. So let me come up with this plan. Falsehood. All heaven must be sighing at God's man, Abram. God gave him so many massive promises and he's in the low spot right now. I told you, I'll probably tell you again through the, through the history of Abram. I gave him a test once. Just things God told him to do. And I gave him markings on that test. The last thing he did got an A+. Everything else got Fs. If you had averaged them together, he would have got an F. But the last thing was most important. It's not how you start, it's how you finish. We're going to get there. But before we get there, we're going to have some, some problems going on. Falsehood. Listen, next came frustration. So it was when Abram came into Egypt that the Egyptians saw the woman. Not just one person, the Egyptians. The princes of Pharaoh also saw her and com commend, uh, commended her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house. Just think of this. This is his frustration. Sarah was, was appropriated for Pharaoh's harem. Although she's 66 years old, she was still a stunning woman to look at. The Pharaoh was probably this guy, Amenhat the I. Um, probably him. By the way, he was called the Good Shepherd. In the Luxor Temple in the Valley of the Kings, there's a massive statue to him. Those of you who have gone to the Holy Land of Egypt with me have seen a men in hit statue, a men in hit one. What's so significant about him besides being the Pharaoh that wanted Sarai? Well, it's this. Now, watch Satan's plan. A men in hit one preserved and elevated the Thebian god Amon Re. That's the sun god or the fatherhead god. That's who he worshiped. That was his number one god. Known to the Egyptians, are you ready for this? The father of all gods. Or simply put, God the Father. So what's going on here? A false God representing the God that Abraham 
just left. Abraham just left the God of the, God the Father. And now there, he's, she's brought into a court with Aminahet the first, who is the father of all gods. Listen, Satan doesn't want us just to get discouraged in our prayers, famine. He wants us to worry about our future, foreboding, and enter into falsehood, which leads to frustration. Now, listen. At the point of frustration, he will attempt to replace your God with a false God. This is good. You'll question your salvation. I've had people that are saved come to me once they're frustrated and they've made some mistakes wondering if they're saved. You'll learn, will lean to your own understanding. You'll fear people in the world. You'll trade your family and your friends and your job for worldly acceptance or worldly pressure. And then it'll happen. Step five, flattery. Always when it's mentioned in scripture, it's a negative thing. Praise is one thing, flattery is negative. Abraham is flattered by Pharaoh. He treated Abraham well for her sake. He had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male and female servants, female donkeys and camels. These are things that Pharaoh gave to Abram. He gave him, he made him extremely rich. Flattery. Satan always blesses rebellion with short-term pleasure. I'll repeat it again. He always blesses rebellion with short-term pleasure. Look, Abram's getting rich. He's also getting something that will eventually plague all of mankind later. Did you see it? Male and female servants. You know who's in part of that? Her name is Hagar. Pharaoh gives Abram a Hagar. He doesn't pick her out. Pharaoh gives him. So he gives him sheep, oxen, he asses, men servants, maid servants, she asses, and camels. Listen, Lot would have been proud of getting rich by denying God. Abraham is doing that. He's getting rich by denying God. The word says Sarah was taken, <clears throat> excuse me, to Pharaoh's house. Just look at the seriousness of trying to give Sarai to Pharaoh. God did not want Sarai's womb to be defiled by a Gentile king who called himself the father of all gods because the Messiah, Jesus, would come from her line of descendants. Can you imagine what Satan's trying to do? He's trying to warp the promised lineage. If this would have happened, Jesus wouldn't have come. Last of all, failure. He treated Abraham well for his, her sake. Again, he had sheep, male, male and female servants, female donkeys, camels. But the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she's my sister? So how did Pharaoh know that? I might have taken her as my wife. Now therefore, here's your wife. Take her and go your way. So Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. Took all those things from Pharaoh. It's a failure, though. It's a failure. So Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had, female servants. God plagued Pharaoh. An unrighteous Pharaoh figured it all out. Can you imagine that? His ungodly morals were of a higher standard than Abraham's, Abram's at this time. What a shame when the world is more righteous than the saints. Abram failed. Thank God that, net, that God redeems. Abram would get another chance. But he didn't exactly escape without a problem. Female servants, Hagar, zero in on it, the fifth in the list. Maid servants, the King James says, female slaves. See, traveling with Abram now, when he goes out, are other people again, like Tira. Only this time, one of, the, one of these ladies would live to a, affect the entire race of mankind forever. From her comes every Arab and every terrorist, by the way, Arab terrorist, Islamic terrorist. You see, backsliding, though for, forgivable, can leave someone with tag-along problems. Because it's here during this bout with backsliding that Abram picks up a slave girl known later as Hagar. She'll live to alter the godly plan in Abram's future life and stall him once again in his, work, in his walk for God. Pharaoh says to Abram right before he tells him to leave Egypt, what is this you've done to me? Sadly, a pagan king had to rebuke Abram God's divine protection of Abram and Sarah shows that if he would have trusted in God and told the truth, everything would have been okay. But God is in the business of growing Abram into a man of great faith, and he has grown into it. This requires circumstances where Abram must trust God. Faith is not a mushroom that grows overnight in damp soil. It's an oak tree that grows for a thousand years under the blast of the wind and rain. How important is it 
that we guard our testimony well, that we never, by word or deed, bring reproach upon the Lord's name to the world. But how do we guard against it? By meeting the simple emotions when they start. Write out famine or the lack of. Write it out. If you're going through something tonight, write it out. Trust God. I'm writing out a cancer that's come back and listen, I'm okay. I feel great. I may have cancer in my body, but I feel great because I'm writing it out with God. Stop fearing the future. It's easy. It's foreboding. Oh, this could happen and that. A lot could happen. I mean, there are people who have prayed for me when I had cancer before. were so concerned and I thank God for them. Pray for me. And they got killed. They got killed riding in a car. We never know. Stop fearing the future. Sufficient is the evil for the day, Jesus said. Trust them. Trust God and not self. That's falsehood. Anytime you trust yourself with a big decision, not asking God, it's falsehood. It's going to lead to problems. Kill frustration with encouragement. Read your word. There's so much encouragement there. If you're frustrated tonight, if you just don't know what to do with a situation, I've, I've counseled so many people that are frustrated. Get back into God. God will not frustrate you, I promise you. And don't accept worldly flattery. Don't accept what the world says to you. It's trying to steer you away. Again, that could be almost anything. And you won't fail. Write out your, your famine. Stop fearing the future, foreboding. Trust God, not self. Don't listen to your falsehoods that you can even tell yourself. Kill frustration with encouragement. Don't accept worldly flattery and you won't fail. God tells us that. Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. And through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. Diffuses means he sends it out. Now I'm going to tell you a, I'm going to tell you a secret to this verse. Among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. Why would he say that? To the one we are the aroma of death leading to death. The other the aroma of life leading to life. And who is sufficient for these things? For we are not. And so, and so many peddling the word of God. But as of sincerity, but as from God, we speak in the sight of God of Christ. What's he saying? Paul's readers in Corinth knew about Roman victories. When the Romans had a victory, they would have a march through the center of Rome. They would have, they would have burning flowers in the center of it, or an offering, something burning. That burning, excuse me, it would be in the middle of the procession. That burning offering would be in the middle of the procession. The ones in front of the procession were the victors. They were the ones that are going to get some prize for this war. The ones behind it are the ones that are the enemies that are going to perish. He says, the fragrance of God burning in the middle is going to be a sweet fragrance to those in front of us, a triumph. It's going to be a failure to those behind us. The fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. That's the, that's the dichotomy of it. It's the real deal when we walk in faith, when we, walk in, when we wait in faith, and when we worship in faith. It's the real deal. The marks of thankful privilege, being led by a sovereign God. Thanks be to God who always leads us. He leads us in the good times. He leads us in the bad times. He leads us in our sufferings. He leads us in our own shortcomings. When God has seen us sovereign in our lives, there's always a purpose and always a plan. The result is unquenchable optimism. In the next couple of weeks, Lord willing, we're going we're gonna to dive into Abram. There's a lot written about Abram. And he is the father of faith, but he's the example of faith, having faith, and yes, of losing your faith. And as we study his life, we'll be studying ours. So tonight... I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to do these things I've said. Write out your famine, your lack of. Stop fearing the future, foreboding. Trust in God, not in yourself. You won't have falsehood. Kill frustration with encouragement. Don't accept worldly flattery. It's not what the world thinks about you. It's what God thinks about you. And you will never fail. Let's pray. Father, I thank you tonight. Thank you for your word. We're learning so much, Lord. Lord, as you're leading us in our path of faith, we are Abram. We are Abraham. We are the one. Lord, some of us have made mistakes. Some of us have come right back, but you always give us an opportunity if we don't forsake you. We ask you tonight, Lord God, to build up those that are listening in the most holy faith, Lord God. Thank you for your word. We know that it builds our faith just by listening to it and by studying it. I pray a blessing on everyone that's listened, Lord, man, woman, child. Lord God, just bless them tonight. Bring us back next week, Lord, you willing. In Jesus' name, Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being with us tonight.